cowboys, the truth about UFOs they don't want us to know. Beautiful women journalists determined to save the day. Sound interesting? I'm Charna Davis Wiese, and on today's UCF in print, resident rocket scientist, Mars expert, space defense expert, plasma physics expert, there's much more I barely understand. Dr. John Brandenburg takes us to a troubling world that has roots in reality. Thank you for joining us. Now, but there's a problem here, though, because this says it's been written by Victor Norgard. Well, <laughs> but I know I the write secret. science books, and uh, my literary agent, who negotiates my book deals, said, "John, if you're going to write a science fiction novel, for God's sake, write it under a pen name." Especially when I described what it was about, and so uh, I was passing through. I had a very pleasant stay in Paris uh, when the Berlin Wall fell, and. Uh, I passed through Gare de Nord railway station, so I rearranged it as Gare Norgard. There we go. So the book is called Morning Star Pass: The Collapse of the UFO Cover Up. Absolutely. Uh, when you, it's going to be re-released, right? You're going to be re-releasing. Yeah, we're it? doing a new, we're doing a new edit on is it. Is Victor still the author, or is it going yes, to be Dr. Be Brent? It's, it's still going to be Victor. Well, I uh, people have responded very favorably to the book. Uh, it's been well reviewed by the two major UFO journals. Uh, which is just UFO magazine and also the MUFON journal. Um, you know, both of them said it was a, a, an important book that people should read. And it is so cool, and, and I, I especially love all the goings on that nobody wants anybody to know about. But but course, usually usually they find out. We've got to show this. Of Absolutely. course, look at that. two characters who would be very at home on this stage <laughs> are Cassandra Chen and Pamela Monroe. There are the, they are the heroines of this book. They're both and as TV you news anchors from well, like a Fox News network. Well, you know what? With two beautiful women in the leads and and this kind of script, I think it's ready for Hollywood. And we've got the poster for it. The movie poster is already ready, but. <laughs> But here we go. We've got we've got uh, everything ready to go now. It's it's very interesting to me that you chose TV journalists, women. Uh, well, as I'll the tell heroine. you, it's it's funny how you write something like this. I wanted to write a novel about uh, the UFO cover-up. You know, the the duty of a science fiction writer is to say what if, and to posit some interesting idea, and then and then take everything you know about life and people and build that around that. Yeah, we could put this down so your arm yeah, doesn't sure. get sore. Right. We'll show it again though, so we can. <laughs> Make sure we go out and buy the book and get ready for the movie. And uh, basically, but when one starts out on a project like that, it's like a dream, and it takes a life of its own. And the characters you've created, they get up off the page and start walking around and talking to you <laughs> occasionally, especially if you're writing at 2 in the morning, on ca fueled on sugar and caffeine. The kids are asleep. I'm a single parent, and they're asleep, and I'm just writing away. So when it's the voices start telling you to do things, maybe oh. you know it's time to go to bed, right? Yes, I did. I did. Uh, um, I had uh, one of the, uh, and, and I, I wanted to write this about, I'd worked with a lot of people in the military and special forces and um, uh, because of my career in space defense and, and things. And so I wanted to basically write a book about that. And I was living in Washington, D.C., so I knew how Washington, D.C. worked and how a cover up, a UFO cover up would really look like when it unraveled. In UF in uh, in uh, Washington D.C., it would look like a Rand Counter Gate or or uh, Watergate, and or worse, or worse. <laughs> and uh, well, in this book, it is worse. <laughs> but then I thought, well, I I should put some women characters in there. And so I thought of I came up with the idea of television news anchors. Uh, suppose they were the ones who broke the cover up <laughs> rather than you know very staid kind of uh, Washington Post characters. Well, it's good. It can it can give those of us who who were in that fifth estate better name. Did you ever see the one of the woman t in the in the rowboat after the hurricanes, talking about the flooded street and three oh, men Katie walked? Corrick. Oh, Three men walked in front of her, and <laughs> so it's good that we have we well, have one. That was a juxtaposition, by the way, the fact that they the, the White House had stage managed some kind of interview with the president talking to the troops, and so that everyone was the the fifth estate was bitterly complaining about stage managing, and then this just almost comical. You couldn't write it. You, you look like a comedy movie. <laughs> but these women are after the truth. After the truth. But, you know, there's, by the way, I did put that element, that kind of element, and of course it, it is television news, and I collected enough stories that, and of course the infighting amongst the other people at the station they work at, and... and that doesn't happen. <laughs> <laughs> and, That's total fiction. And of course the station, the, the person who owns the cable news network hates scandal. He's, it's just a kind of a family values network, and and um, 
So uh, the, the blonde, as it turns out, is a UFO abductee. And she has a pretty messed up life. Now, does she know? And does she remember that she's a UFO no, abductee? No, she doesn't. She doesn't know it until her, her, her lover gets killed, who also investigating the story. He's sent out to California to investigate one aspect. In fact, he, he wants to go out and investigate this, and he's set up and killed. So we have more than one type of space alien here. We have, we, yes. they're, they're, not, they're not all the same. They're from different areas, different personalities, different Different objectives. stars, different colors, different brightness. You some have, want, some want power. And like you said, some are pretty nice and just want to leave the Earth alone. Well, the, the really nice ones don't want anything to do with the Earth. They don't want to get their pretty hands dirty here. And, and of course, then there are others who are involved. Uh, and actually, um, what comes out in this novel, and I base this novel on reports of, from ufology, people who you know, believe they've been abducted by aliens, and what do they report? And a lot of them say the same thing over and a lot over of the same, same, same. And in fact, if you, you look at what's, what types of aliens are reported, I tended to put those in the novel. And one type that is reported looks just like us. <laughs> yes. It helps <laughs> And act just like us, too. <laughs> helps in and, uh, the book. and so then another group looks quite different, looks a little short, gray aliens, big heads, you know, you know very non-human, humanoid but not, not human. And then there are some that are just could walk around the street you'd never notice. And in fact, the special forces in there have a special test. They do an earwax test on people. If they catch somebody and they think they're an alien here spying, they test their earwax and they have a test that tells them whether they're, uh, and, they, and they, use, they use dogs to tell if you're from outer space or not. Because they have they, dogs trained to the sniff dogs know. The dogs know. And, uh, but the, one of the ideas this is based on is an idea from SETI, which is a search for extraterrestrial intelligence. That's the idea of mediocrity. Mediocrity means that the human race is mediocre, that we're not remarkable or exotic in the cosmos. Everything we do here, the Earth itself, everything that people do, and I'm not talking about Americans. I'm talking about everybody Everybody. on this planet throughout history. The things that we do are actually according to this assumption, are typical of intelligent life in the universe. In other words, we're not remarkable. If there's a galactic capital and a human being walked down the street, he probably wouldn't be noticed as being from Earth. So in other words, why would we be the only ones if we were mediocre? Right. Well, that's the thing. But the also the, the this is the idea, by the way, that SETI uses to, in order to look for radio signals. They say, well, whoever's sending these are similar enough to us. You know, we're kind of we're kind of average. We're mediocre. We're C students in the cosmos. We're average. We're kind of mainstream. And whoever else sends us uh, radio signals. Radio signals sent, by the way, from a galaxy far, far away <laughs> a long time ago, so they can't come here and get to us. Mm-hmm. They're probably similar to us, too. And what I realized when I wrote this is that that means the cosmos is a pretty desperate and dramatic place if everybody out there is like us. <laughs> and one woman abductee, she was abducted by some of these very, very human sort of aliens. The, the two newswomen are interviewing her, and the blonde says, well, what did they want? <laughs> <laughs> and she says, they wanted what, what most men want. Oh, <laughs> so I say, sir, they say, well, I guess. Football and foot- beer. <laughs> football and beer. <laughs> and then, of course, uh, so it's a whole spectrum of types, some of which look like us, some of which don't, right. and they have varying intentions. And there's more than this. There's a lot of excitement. Well, You've they, they, got they, they, cover-ups and leaks and, and, and well, an asteroid. What and happens is the meanest, most vicious aliens in here, guess who the government is in bed with? The ones this. they can get the most out of, which are usually the meanest and most vicious. That's right. <laughs> the ones who have an active interest here and want to deal with the government in secret. And the government, a long time ago, has allowed these aliens to, in secret, imagine close encounters of the third kind, the meeting of the government and the aliens at that devil's tower. Mm -hmm. Imagine that really happened in this novel. And that the government then, in complete secrecy, allowed the aliens to move into that mesa, put up a big guard fence around it, and 
let the aliens, the aliens are supposed to give us all this good stuff because we're letting them stay here and study us. And, and, and now 30 years have gone by and nothing, nothing that's supposed to have happened has happened. We haven't gotten any good stuff from them. And instead, they're mutilating all the cattle, which means the local ranchers and cowboys are very upset. And they know there's a big fence around this mesa, that the government is hiding something there. And they know that just about the time that fence went up, suddenly people started slicing up their cattle and leaving them for them to find. That's $500 a head, and insurance <laughs> won't cover it. That's right. Because so there, these cowboys, so actually you have cowboys and aliens from outer space <laughs> interacting. And TV news journalists. And TV news, oh, the TV news journalists come out, and one is Asian, you know, they're both beautiful and glamorous, and, and there's all these cowboys are hovering around them, and this one, uh, one rancher says to the uh, Asian, she says, uh, he says, well, where are you from, honey? And, and he, she says, I'm from San Diego, and he says, no, I mean originally. <laughs> and she says, uh, kind of getting a little tense. She says, I'm from San, I grew I was born in San Diego. And then the, then the, he just turns to the blonde and says, where are you from, girl? And she says, Kiev. And he says, where's that near? And she says, Moscow. And he says, Idaho. <laughs> and she says, sure. He knew. He <laughs> and knew the idea is the joke that anybody, anybody can be an American. American doesn't look like anything anymore. Right. And people who look classically American, are for actually from someplace else, right. and the people who look exotic are actually all American girls from San Diego who right. grew up rich and were cheerleaders and homecoming <laughs> queens. Well, we also have we have the leak. Yes, you have and we the have also secret prisons. Oh, what's funny? I anticipated a lot of what's in the news on this because what the Congress, they, the the two newswomen are successful in that they get the Congress and the FBI to start to investigate. And the president gets, the sitting president gets pulled into this, and he sides with this secret government council that says that this must, this whole secret treaty and the alien stuff must remain absolutely secret. And there's a saying that's said in the, several times in the book, absolute secrecy creates absolute power. And we all know what absolute power creates. It creates absolute corruption. And so you have a secret kingdom run nominally by the U.S. government, at least they control the fence line, and then you have the aliens from outer space who have no, don't place any particular value on human life or dignity whatsoever. They place, in fact, one person says, he says, I don't know who cares less about human beings, this government or the aliens. And the things that go on at the secret base in the, in the mountains are pretty horrendous. I basically took pages from World War II where there were a lot of terrible reports about what was going on in Nazi Germany, but no one believed them because they couldn't believe human beings would do those things to other human beings. And it all collapses. It all comes completely unraveled. And finally, when it does, um, the president is being asked, told by the Congress, you must tell us what this secret treaty you signed says who is it with for one thing uh, and he says treaty? and he says i'm declaring a state of emergency and the secret government by that time has decided to what they say turn kick over the chessboard and go all out um, what happens during the time of the congressional investigations and the cover up is unraveling and they have congressional hearings. Finally, they bring out the proverbial alien in a pickle jar. And well, and one of the sci one of the people, the UFO experts, they bring in testify says it's it's a very horrible thing to display that person's body like this. You should treat it with respect. And the senator, this old gravelly voiced senator, says, uh, "We'll get to the subject of horrendous things here really quick in this hearing." And when this happens, the president who is in danger now of being impeached because he won't cooperate, declares a state of emergency. And the, what happens then, the secret government moves troops in black with backed by tanks. They seal off the bridges across the Potomac River. In the Pentagon, um, the head of the Joint Chief stands up in front of the other leaders and says, the president is declaring a state of emergency and has declared Congress in recess indefinitely until this crisis is over and you'll all be receiving orders 
on what to do. He says, public order must be maintained at all costs, all costs. And the leader of the army and the Marines stand up and say, we're not putting in effect any state of emergency. And uh, basically the, the Army, Navy, and uh, Marines will not go along with the Air Force in declaring a state of emergency, in honoring the state of emergency. And the chief of the Army basically takes control and just says, uh, I think we should all go back to our offices and wait till this little uh, fiasco across the river. What they don't realize is that troops in black are sealing off the uh, secret government has its own armored brigade, as it turns out. And Not only does it have secret prisons and secret bases, it has its own little secret paramilitary. And they're counting, by the way, on the aliens to show up and cow everyone in the sky that night. But it's cloudy. <laughs> no one can see the aliens. And then the National Guard of Maryland, state of Maryland, suddenly rolls into the city to support the Congress. And I won't tell you what happens next. I will just tell Aww. you. I will just tell you that um, what happens in the streets of Washington D.C. after that is a well. It is an armed struggle for power, like has happened in many other capitals of many other countries and in their is, history. And this is not only involving the United States. No, no. This is not involving the United States at all. I mean, just as Alone. a single nation, though. In fact, it's a I bring that out that the other countries begin, who, who basically played along with this conspiracy of silence, especially the Russians and the French. Uh, the morning the UFO cover-up collapses, um, the two <laughs> news anchors are driving to work <laughs> and uh, they spot a turtle crossing the road. <laughs> I think and, he likes this part. <laughs> and, and they start they get all frantic to save this turtle. When they don't realize that all of, all of creation is about ready to go up and smoke. Well, the turtle represents the human race. Yes, a, a metaphor. <laughs> a metaphor. And, Slowly uh, plodding along, but, unaware of what's going on. But what, as they're doing this, the Russian and French governments announce that yes, they're aware of an alien presence at Earth and uh, that the United States has a secret treaty with them. And so this comes out and by the time they get to work, the State Department has asked for clarifications on the Russian <laughs> French announcement. <laughs> so I, I try to, uh, in fact, the British are watching this. They know that a coup will occur. They know that an armed coup is being planned against the Congress for opposing the president. And they said, because they found out from them, and they, and they don't know who to tell in the U.S. government. Because they don't know who's going to. They don't be know on the who's, who's going to side right with side. who. And the, in fact, the the blonde is finally standing on the roof of the CNS tower, which is located in Washington D.C., watching troops move around on the uh, bridges, and she sees the Marines in coming from the highways up north, coming north towards the bridges, and she says, "Well, we don't know whose side they're on." <laughs> So there's a lot of suspense and a lot goes on. And this all comes from your imagination. Yes. And you had mentioned something to me before about getting attached to your characters. The characters oh. take on a life. They become your creations. And then you have to play God, so to speak, oh, with what happens to them. Is that, 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 that seems it like is. it's difficult for it you. It is. It was very difficult uh, because the modern female hero, by the way, is in danger. And when she's cut, she bleeds. Unlike the heroine of uh, the classic heroine of classical literature, which always seemed to manage to only get her hair must. Uh, I have two female characters. I have very heroic, you know, I have a hero. He's the leader of the special forces. Uh, he's seduced by <laughs> Cassandra and decides to mutiny with all his troops against the secret government. And, um, well, it pushes him over the edge. He doesn't know what to do, and um, it helps him make his. Decision. It helps him make his decision, and but she gave him an offer he couldn't refuse. Well, um, at one point, one of the characters was gonna was going to get killed during the coup, the fighting involving the coup, and uh, and I was writing at two o'clock in the morning, and the Cassandra character showed up. She said, "If you kill my friend, I'm not going to do anything for you in the rest of the book." <laughs> oh so that's there. That's that's the way it is. So, she, you know, she can't get killed. And 
But you, but you, seriously, you, you, I thought, well, it's time. Okay, I'm going to change. It's time to go to bed. You did struggle. You did struggle about oh, what to do with her. Oh, seriously. I did. Well, because she's, both of them are in great danger, especially she's the, you know, kind of chief heroine in she ultimately, during the coup, is captured by the secret government. And this is the worst fear of her. Of, she has been carrying cyanide. And she's thrown the cyanide away, thinking that the danger is over. And then suddenly, in the chaos after the, the collapse of the coup attempt, she's suddenly captured. And hi, basically, her helicopter is hijacked. And she ends up at the secret base, in, no longer secret base in Colorado, full of drug-crazed guards who are, um, it's, it's complete chaos. It's the Fuhrer bunker. It's, it's the Fuhrer bunker. It's the fall of the Third Reich in Berlin. And the so you do use a lot of reality and historical fact I, to, I, to write I, these I, books. Well, I, I look, what does it look like when an utterly corrupt and ruthless government, even a secret one, collapses? And when it's made its big gamble and lost, what happens? And what happens is, Discipline breaks down. Uh, it's it's people's, like chaos. chaos and it's, it's chaos. So they're in a secret, a secret base in this devil's mesa, and it's complete chaos. They have at least three factions of the guards running around with guns on drugs. And uh, they've, they, in the meantime, the U.S. military is outside and is getting ready to attack the base if they don't. And then they, downstairs they have the aliens. The aliens have said they're going to fight to the last man. They will surrender. They will not surrender, and they're going to kill every human being in the place. If the if the place falls to the U.S. government, they will kill every human being. There are so many <laughs> intricate twists and things that happen, and, and it, it, it's obviously a very detailed book. And you talked about writing in the middle of the night, deciding what to do with Cassandra. Do you? Do you plan I agonized it out? over what would happen to her at the base. By really, the way, I know, I know, I, I can tell you. It was almost like a friend of yours, and you you had to protect her. Almost. Well, you 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 have to wonder. You you get emotionally involved. These characters, they and by the way, I added the two women characters originally as kind of an after afterthought after I'd written a few hundred pages on the book, and then they took over the book. <laughs> they women. got up off the pages, start walking around. <laughs> They uh, they said, oh no, this should happen, that should happen, and um, and uh, I don't know, I I uh, I basically took all of these. I thought all of the smart, pretty women I've known during my career. I basically they all kind Put of condensed. In. In. But do you plan this out? Do you, do you know what's going to happen in the end when you started, or does I, it just you just go? No, not completely. I uh, especially towards the end. The, the last days of the secret government in its secret base, uh, I didn't know what would happen in the Mesa. I didn't know what would happen to the heroine. Um, they tell, the secret government tells her that um, they want her to make a broadcast for them since she's so persuasive. She's gonna supposed to make a broadcast basically telling the Earth to surrender, that the aliens, you know, this is just a temporary setback. The aliens are the real power over the Earth, they control the space around the Earth, and they will control the Earth eventually. And it's, it's really fighting them is futile. And uh, they want her to make that speech. And she has her own ideas. No, she <laughs> doesn't. She kind of try to. Oh try to, well, I, I won't give actually, away all the details of what when happens. She's actually but saying their words, kind of, sort of, not really. They 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 say, uh, make this broadcast, or we'll have you tortured to death. And, uh, and they do things like that to people in this book. Mm -hmm. They have secret prisons. They have their own secret police. This is a secret government supported by its secret police, its own secret police. And, and those are the ones who could be most vicious. And, they, were, and they, they do what all secret police do all over the world. This is people. so visual. Like, as you're telling me, talking about this book, I'm picturing the Hollywood set. Picture tracer bullets hitting the dome of the Capitol. So what about a movie? Well, I've been in discussions with I several know. people from Hollywood. I actually wrote a screenplay based on this book, and it made it was a finalist in the Miramax uh, screenwriting contest last mm -hmm. year. I've now uh, I've, I've tightened it up, and I'm going to re reintroduce it. I'm just going to start submitting it to screenplay writing contests. That, that must are, be an odyssey in and of itself. Oh, it's a completely <laughs> different thing to do to write a screenplay as opposed to a book. Uh, but it was it was fun, and uh, I felt uh, since I, since two people 
from Hollywood had approached me saying, gee, your book would make a great movie. Uh, have you got a screenplay? And It helps to have one. It helps to have <laughs> one. So I decided, I said, sure, <laughs> sure. I'm working on one right now. And then I went and hastily wrote one. And uh, it was really stupid. I basically took the entire novel and tried to load it into a screenplay <laughs> formatting. <laughs> It doesn't work that it, way. It was all amateur night, you know, <laughs> and it shows. But uh, the the sparkling of the characters shows through. Um, you know, I haven't talked about the the hero is based on many people from special forces that I've known, worked with in former military or, or present military. So and he is a he is a very honorable, very heroic figure. What was the hardest thing to do? Actually, write the book or actually work on the publishing? Set? Oh, the <laughs> publishing was an, uh, you. I I'll, I'll tell you one story. It just involved editing the book. The 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 book was accepted for publication as an ebook. And then people immediately said, saying, "Well, I want a written book. I want a print book that I can read before I go to sleep at night." And so enough people said that to me that it said I said, "Okay." Uh, so I, I arranged to get a, a print version done. And um, then the ebook people said, oh, well, we're going to do a print version too. And, but by that time, I'd already gotten the wheels going too. But what happened was I wanted, it's one thing to write a large novel. And I wanted to write a big novel like War and Peace. In fact, one person gave me the compliment, this is War and Peace. Because otherwise, why do it? Why do it? You can't it's talk the about the possible of the UFO cover up. It's a collapse pages. of a cover up of cosmic proportions. It has to be you can't write this in a little paper, thin paperback. So I, I basically um, I tried to get this thing edited. And I, you can't edit your own stuff. And, and I went through so many people would say, would read it, would read parts of it and say, oh, sure, I'll do this for $300. And then I send them the book, and then they say, oh, I'm at 3000 <laughs> <laughs> When they actually got this. <laughs> That's right. And uh, I sent it to the manuscript into the publisher, and they suddenly sent back the book. And I said, well, the there's finish, still typos the finished, in it. The finished book <laughs> that was not edited. Yeah. And they said, "Oh, if you want to fix that, that's that's going to cost us extra money. You know, we're we're not a really big operation here. So um, you want to delay this book, or you want it you want it out?" And so basically, I have gotten somebody to edit it. So we're going to do a new uh, revised. It's it's not going to change anything. It's just going to clear up the typos. Well, we'll we'll be sure to get that out there. And everybody, you really have to pick this up and read it, and and try not to be too scared when you're reading it, because after all, it is only. It is. It is. <laughs> many people who especially were familiar. I put everything I understood about the whole UFO. It's all in there. Genre in there, and it was well reviewed by the. Uh, both the MUFON Journal and the UFO Magazine said this is a good book. Everybody should read it. And they said it's scary. This it in fact, is. this is your worst nightmare this about is the it. UFO cover-up. <laughs> this is it. Morningstar Pass, the collapse of the UFO cover-up. It says Victor Norgard, but it's our little secret. It's really Dr. John Brandenburg. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us. It was really Thank a you. pleasure. Thank I'm Charter Davis-Weesey. Join us again next time for UCF in print.